I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fail Were never enough Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing that's better than you You turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the Nothing that's better than you. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to see you guys this morning. I'm Barrett Bowden, a lead pastor here at ICC, and I welcome you today. Um, I am incredibly grateful for each and every one of you. I love you all. We love you here as a church, and more importantly, God loves you, and I just pray this morning that you will know his love. We're going to be continuing our series this morning in the book of 2 Samuel. And so if you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you and ask you to open them. If not, they'll be here on the screen. But today we're going to be looking at a really important passage in 2 Samuel as we look at chapters 15 through 17. This morning we're going to be talking uh, as we continue our series on the theme of receiving grace. And if you've got something to write notes with, I would encourage you always to do so because I truly believe it's going to be hard to really understand the fullness of what God might want to teach us today if we're not engaging in some way actively with our minds and finding some way to not just listen this morning, but to actually understand and then live in light of what we hear. And hopefully that you'll also disciple others in your life. Uh, into what you yourself learned this morning. So I would encourage you as always to take notes. But this morning our title is Receiving Grace and the subtitle is Living in the Freedom of Forgiveness. Receiving Grace, Living in the Freedom of Forgiveness. We've been talking throughout this series about the theme of 2 Samuel being the, the very title of our series and that is the theme of Redeeming Grace. If y'all will, read our theme with me here on the screen. God is faithful to redeem his people and fulfill his covenant of grace. Sure, the book we've been saying again and again centers a lot on people, especially King David. And King David is known after, as a man after God's heart. He wants to lead a people after God's heart. But the reality is, ultimately, the hope for the nation of Israel, the hope for David himself is not in what David, who he is, or how he can lead, or what he can do to fix things, because we see again and again that the Bible is really honest about its quote-unquote heroes. They are all flawed. They are all imperfect. They are all messed up. Ain't no chance if it depends on the quote-unquote heroes of Scripture. The hero of Scripture is singular, and it's God himself. And what we see in this book, again, is that the hope and the hero of the book is not David, it's God. And it's God being a redeeming God, God being a, a faithful God, God being a God who is a God of grace. And that is the hope for your life and mine as well. It is not about us, friends. It is about God. And what we have to learn to do again and again and again is come to terms with how broken and how flawed we are so that at the same time, we can understand how loved, how gracious, how faithful uh, God is as we rely completely and totally upon him. So this morning, we're going to be making headway, and we got a lot of scripture to cover, you already. Um, I just want to go and tell you 
The theme that we're going to be talking about today is an incredibly important and personal one for all of us. There's going to be a lot of scripture that we're going to read here at the beginning. And the perspective that we're going to be taking today is not very obvious at surface level. And so while we're going to be reading about things related to rebellion and conflict and war and family issues, once more, similar to what we did last week, I don't want you to ignore the opportunity that we have before us today to actually lean in and to pay attention to what's going on. Because underneath the surface of what's going on is an incredible lesson for you today as a believer in Jesus Christ that I honestly believe, because I know myself and I've pastored long enough to know most of you, that we all struggle with. So what I want you to do is as we spend about 10 minutes or so reading these three chapters of Scripture, lean in, don't tune out. And then after, we're going to unpack it and look at some deeper level things that are going on in this passage. All of it related to living in a posture of being a receiver of God's grace and living in the freedom that God would want for us to live in, the freedom of his forgiveness. So if you've got your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 15, I read from the English Standard Version. And I would encourage you, if you would, to follow along either in your Bible or here on the screen. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And when he said, your servant is such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, well, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, oh, that there were a judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or calls might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And Absalom did this to all of Israel, who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, "Uh, please let me go and and pay my vow, which I vowed to the Lord in Hebron. Uh, For your servant vowed a vow while I lived in Geshur and Aram, saying, if the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will go and offer worship to the Lord. Well, the king said to him, go in peace. So he arose and he went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. Well, with Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests and they went in their innocence and they knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, Gila. And the conspiracy grew strong. And the people with Absalom kept increasing. And a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee or, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all of his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, and they halted at the last house. And all of his servants passed by him, and the Cherethites and all the Pelethites and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. And then the king said to Ittai, the Gittite, Why do you also go with us? Go back and and stay with the king, for, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander about with us? Since I go, I not know where. Go back and take your brothers with you, and and may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. But Atai answered the king, 
as the Lord lives and as my Lord the King lives. Wherever my Lord the King shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. And David said to Ittai, go then, pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all of his men and all the little ones who were with him, and all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by. And the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with, him, with, uh, with all the Levites, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. And then the king said to Zadok, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and its dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons. Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is upon, among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. While David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. And David said to him, If you go on with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so now I will be your servant. Then you will defeat me from the council of Ahithophel. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priest with you there? So whatever you hear from the king's house, tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priest. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send to me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now when David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, a 100 bunches of raisins, and a 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, Why have you brought these? And Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, And where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he, he remains in Jerusalem, for he said, Today the house of Israel will give me back to the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. Let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord, the king. Well, when King David came to Barun, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemai the son of Gera, and as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David, and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men were on his right and on his left. And Shammai said as he cursed, Get out! Get out, you man of blood, you worthless man! The Lord is avenged on you, all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is upon you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeriah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, your sons of Zeriah? If he's cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David? Who then shall say, why have you done so? 
And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse? For the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road while Shammai went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he refreshed himself. Now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. And when Hushai the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king! And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. And again, whom should I serve? Should it not be his son? As I have served your father, so will I serve you. Well, then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel. What shall we do? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go in to your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the counsel of Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and by Absalom. Chapter 17, verse 1. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic. And all the people who are with him will flee. And I will strike down only the king. And I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Call Hushai the archite also, and let's hear what he has to say. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, Thus has Ahithophel spoken. Shall we do as he says? If not, you can speak. Then Hushai said to Absalom, This time the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good. Hushai said, You know that your father and his men are mighty men, and that they are enraged like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Besides, your father is an expert in war. He will not spend the night with his people. Behold, even now he has hidden himself in one of the pits or in some other place. And as soon as some of the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, there has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And then even the valiant man, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will utterly melt with fear. For all of Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and that those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all Israel be gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, as the sand by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in person. So we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found, and we shall light upon him as the dew falls upon the ground. And of him and all the men with him, not one will be left. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we shall drag it into the valley until not even a pebble is to be found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, Hmm, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. Well, then Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar the priest, Thus and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus so have I counseled. Now, therefore, send quickly and tell David, 
do not stay tonight at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king and all the people who were with him be swallowed up. Well, now Jonathan and Ahimaaz were waiting at Enrogel. A female servant was about to go tell them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they were not to be seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So both of them went away quickly, and they came to the house of a man at Byram, who had a well in his courtyard, and they went down into it. And the woman took the spread and a covering over the well's mouth and scattered grain on it, and nothing was known of it. Well, when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Imaz and Jonathan? And the woman said to them, uh, They've gone over to the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went, and they told King David. And they said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. Then David arose, and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey, and he went off home to his own city. He set his house in order, and he hanged himself, and he died, and was buried in the tomb of his father. Then David came to Maname, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel, now Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra, the Ishmaelite, who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zariah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. Now when David came to my name, Shobai, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Makur, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Rogalim, brought beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, lentils, honey, curds, and sheep, and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. This is God's Word. Today, we are going to be talking about receiving grace. We're going to be talking about learning to live in the freedom of forgiveness. I want to thank Rob Hodum, who is here today. We have taught second, first and second Samuel together with others from our church in numerous places over the last decade, helping to train leaders and pastors, especially in the most uh, needy places in the world where theological training is quite desperate. And uh, we have had the great joy as a church. It's not just myself and others, but we as a church are committed to investing among the nations so that more and more people might have the opportunity to know Jesus, and also so that more and more church planters and pastors might have the opportunity to get good theological training in the Word of God. Aren't you grateful that we as a church are committed to more than just ourselves, are committed to the spread of the gospel and the planting of churches here and around the world? I'm so grateful. I'm giving thanks to Rob because what I'm going to be teaching you today is a truth that we have discovered over the years as we have taught Samuel together. And Rob has been instrumental in helping me see some of these truths from this particular passage. And this week on our Transform for Impact podcast, you'll actually have the opportunity to hear an interview with Rob uh, and myself as he describes how the truths that you're going to be hearing this morning have played out in his own life and his own journey with God. And I believe from today's sermon, and also if you listen to the interview this week, you will have opportunity to really, truly find the truth of God's word and also journey closer to transformation in God's truth as you seek to know him. So I want to thank you, Rob, so much. I want to give you our core truth for the day, and the core truth is this, and I would encourage everyone to write it down. We must learn to live in the freedom of God's forgiveness. That's basically me repeating the title of today's message, okay? But what I'm saying is you've got to turn it into something personal. You have to learn, we all have to learn, to live in the freedom of God's forgiveness. Now, 
I will explain this more at the end of the message today, but I'll go ahead and put it in the core truth because of how important it is to understand. Here's what it looks like. Daily receiving his grace by keeping our hearts and our hopes set upon Jesus. Forgiving ourselves of what God has forgiven us and trusting his word over our feelings. We must learn to live in the freedom of God's forgiveness, daily receiving his grace by keeping our hearts and our hopes set upon Jesus. Forgiving ourselves of what God has forgiven us and trusting his word over our feelings. You might ask, huh? How do we get that out of what we just read? Pause. I'm going to answer that question in just a second. First, I want to give you the structural overview of the passage because it's my commitment week after week to make sure that you're really understanding what's going on in the Word of God. So let me look real quick at the passage breakdown. Most of you guys can see this breakdown if you're using uh, a, a translation of the Bible that has headers. Typically, you can follow the plot line of the passage. And I'm not doing much more than just trying to help you keep up with the plot. But it is important that you understand where the story is in relation to where it's been and where it's heading. If you remember, uh, where we were last week was Absalom had um, killed his brother Amnon after Amnon had raped his half-sister Tamar. Incredible dysfunction, conflict, just horrific sins in David's family. And we talked about how all of that, you could just see the ripple effects of David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah echoed out into his children. And you could just see the ripple effects of generational sin in his family. And at the end of the passage where we left last week, we, we saw that incredible moment where David, with his role as a king, yes, he could have execute, executed justice and just be done with Absalom, but in his heart as a father, he found a way through the help of a counselor to, to make things right with Absalom and to allow him to come back into Jerusalem. That's where we left off last week. But while it was a physical reconciliation, what we learned quickly here is that it wasn't a true relational reconciliation, at least on the part of Absalom. Because in chapter 15, as the passage opens, immediately after Absalom basically gets rid of his house arrest, immediately after he makes good with his dad again, you see that his heart has not been changed by God. His heart is still a deceptive heart. His heart is still a self-centered heart. His heart is, is still literally out for power, for sex, for money, ultimately to take over the kingship. We see how he begins to spin lavishly on himself and he puts chariots all around him and he's got this army of people that move about with him wherever he goes and quickly he's starting to gather popularity in Israel. He's a spectacle to behold. And we see how he starts ruling, taking David's place at the gate and making judgments, which is that which for a king to make, but actually stopping people as they're coming in to see his dad and trying to handle the matters for them instead of actually allowing them to get to his dad. And we see that in ways, at least in the eyes of people, certainly not in the eyes of God, he grows in popularity. And it's another telltale reminder, friends. You can have approval with people and yet not have approval with God. Be careful where you shop for your approval. Be careful. This guy had it all together, it looked like, in the world. But with God, he could not have been further from his heart. What we see is, is chapter 15 opens in these first verses, we see that he actually mounts a full-on conspiracy to take over the throne. And what happens is this dude named Ahithophel, can y'all say that with me real quick? It's a fun one. Good job, you got all the H's in, all right? That's a, that's a doozy, right? If you're looking for a child name, I would not recommend that. Um, but Ahithophel, 
Um, can you imagine kindergarten with that name? That would be a tough one, man. At least you go first because it's the A, you know, it's, that's a good thing. But this dude comes alongside of Absalom and turns against David. Now you might go, okay, what we learn about Ahithophel, he's one of David's closest counselors. This is a pretty big betrayal for David, and it hurts him deeply. But what you've got to remember is in the scripture, what we sometimes we gloss over genealogies. Who would care to admit that you've glossed over a genealogy as you've read the Bible before? Okay, at least some of you are honest. Um, the rest of you, I know you. Uh, we all have glossed over genealogies before, but they are important. In the, in the moment like this, what you learn is that Ahithophel's granddaughter was Bathsheba. Okay? Now, the collective moan is because what we know is David sinned horrifically by raping Bathsheba and killing her husband. This is a moment for Ahithophel and ways to get revenge upon David. Now, it does not turn out well for him in the end. We know that after just reading the text. And he's turning in ways against his own grandson or great-grandson with Solomon. But he chooses to turn. And Ahithophel and Absalom end up leading this rebellion against David. They gather people together in Hebron. And the, the sickness of Absalom's heart and it's just like what Jesus encountered in his day, and I believe, friends, it's still alive in our day, to use religion as a cover-up for our own sin. Absalom goes in, and under religious pretense of going to make these sacrifices at this festival in his heart, you know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, look, you do all this on the outside, you get all these places of honor, you are known as all these people who are all this religious, you know, goodness and morality, but I see your heart. The religious facade sometimes covers over deep sin within us that is hidden and not repented and forsaken of. And it is such as true with Absalom. And what we see is there at that religious festival that he asked his dad to attend and his dad blessed, he actually uses that moment, taking some of 200 of his officials captive, he uses that moment to mount a full-on rebellion against the king. David hears about the rebellion in chapters. 15 verses 13 to 17, and he ends up fleeing. He says, yo, we're getting out of town, and he flees Jerusalem. Well, we see uh, David's great sorrow as well at the end of chapter 15. We see a man who is just completely broken and devastated, weeping as he crosses over the brook of Kidron up the Mount of Olives. And we see loyalty by some who have chosen to maintain, similar to what I think about with Esther in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, David's, one of his body men, says, look, where you go, I go. I'm with you, man. And we do see people remain loyal to him. In chapter 16, as it unfolds, we get into this odd little story that we're going to come back to later. So I need you to push pause and know that we're going to come back to it. But Ziba comes to David with a report, basically, that things aren't going well with Mephibosheth, and David ends up getting deceived by Ziba. We'll come back to it later, but he ends up, in this moment, giving Mephibosheth's inheritance to Ziba. Then you have this random story of this dude, Shammai, who basically comes out and just starts going, David, you're a loser. David, Blood's on your hands. David, you're the worst. David, this, is a, this kingdom's about to get taken away from you. And he's throwing rocks and dirt, and he's just heaping stuff on him. And David lets it be. And then what we see is that in chapter 16, the latter half, starting in verse 15, Absalom actually enters into Jerusalem. And we see this odd story, and it would make a great movie, I do believe, but essentially where David has a dear friend who ends up pledging loyalty to David, but yet basically becoming a spy in the camps of Absalom. And they work out a system in great prayer and hope that God will somehow confuse the counsel of Ahithophel to basically get word back to David of what was going to happen. And what ends up happening is that word gets back to David and Ahithophel's plans are frustrated. If they had not been, probably David would have died. 
and it ends up turning against Ahithophel, and we'll see as we look next week, it will end up turning against Absalom. And essentially what we see here in chapter 17 is this dear friend, Hushai, who entered into Absalom's presence as a spy, ends up being the very key to David's rescue from trouble. Okay? Everybody understanding the basic plot line of what's happening here? Yes. Okay. I'm actually looking at your eyes. Some people say to me, you, you look like you're looking at me when, I'm, when you're preaching. And I always say back, I am. <laughs> so if it looks like I look you in the eyes, I actually just did, okay? So thank you for your responsiveness. I'm actually preaching to you. So let's continue. I want to go back to our core truth. Because our core truth for the day, again, you might have scratched your head and gone, how are we here as a core truth and as a theme when the plot line was there? I'm not connecting the dots. And there's something under the surface that I want to teach you this morning. We got to learn something as we look at David's life here. Because one of the, one of the great problems of studying the Old Testament often is that we look at it and we try to make everyone a hero. We try to just kind of minimize the character's flaws and maximize their strengths. And, and suddenly what happens is we, we almost approach stories in a moralistic kind of way. Oh, I wish I could be like David. When actually it's not about that at all. I mean, there are some good things that we should celebrate and desire to imitate. Sure. But friends, the characters of the Bible are flawed. And so are we. And it is so important that as we look at text, that we not so celebrate David, that we completely overlook his struggles. Because if we overlook his struggles, we'll miss part of the opportunity that the Word of God presents to us and is given for us. One of the things we see in these chapters, it's subtle, but it is there. It's a dominant theme, is that David is struggling to receive God's redeeming grace. And I believe, if we're honest this morning, that we would say, even those of us who have gone to God for forgiveness and have been covered by God in the grace given, afforded to us by the person and work of Jesus Christ, even for those of us who have positionally been made right with God by His grace, practically and personally struggle on a daily basis to actually live in light of what God declares is true. And when that happens, friends, the ripple effects of not being able to learn to live in the grace that God freely gives us is, is that it inhibits the freedom that God would want for us to experience with Him to live in the fullness of what He desires for the glory of His name. And in this passage, what we see is David greatly inhibited by a reality that he had not forgiven himself for what God had already forgiven him. Namely, we're talking about his horrific sins with Bathsheba and with Uriah in both rape and murder. And all the fallout of those sins in his family what we see here is a man, and I believe a picture of ourselves, who has struggled, though forgiven in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, completely forgiven. We talked about that weeks ago. He went to God. Psalm 51 came out of that moment. God, I need your forgiveness and grace. He's completely forgiven. Unbelievable that God forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Isn't it unbelievable that God forgives us? It is unbelievable. We should never get over God's grace and forgiveness. But here's a man who has been forgiven in chapter 12 and yet can't seem to actually live in light of that forgiveness. I want to prove it to you by looking at the text. And basically what we're going to be talking here today about is the effects of lingering guilt in our life. Let's look at the first way. The effect of lingering guilt. Now we're going to go through a couple of these and I want you to notice. Here's what we're going to be doing. I want you to notice how David has changed 
from before his most horrific sins in his life with Bathsheba and Uriah to after. Okay? Before he sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah, what we see in the scripture is that David is a man confident in God's calling upon his life. By no means of his own, he knows God has made him king. He does not look at outward appearance. He looks upon the heart. He's called David to be a man after his heart and to lead as a representation of his righteousness in all forms of his kingship, but especially including that of executing judgment. So, for instance, you get a verse like 2 Samuel chapter 8, and again, I'm going to ask you to please write down the references as much as you can, verse 15, where it says, So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. You can look at several stories where you can see how David is living in his calling and living in confidence in God's truth, and he's executing equity and righteousness to all his people. And yet, what happens after is quite a different story. Before he executes judgment, but after we have this. He withholds judgment. One of the things that is just overwhelmingly obvious, if you start reading chapter 15 and look at those first six verses, so for instance, if you go back now, you can blame Absalom, sure. Absalom gets his chariot, it says here in verse 1. And he, he rises early and he goes and he stands by way of the gate. And he's basically intervening, executing judgment instead of his dad. Right? And if you read those verses, like in verse 3, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right. There is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were a judge in the land. He's basically like, oh, if my dad were just a better king. Oh, if there was just a better system of justice. Oh, if there weren't a judge in the land. He's basically going, oh, if it were, if, if, it, if it just could be me. Now, you could blame Absalom. But who's Absalom's daddy? In other words, who's the boss of Absalom? King David. You could blame Absalom, but Absalom is a crown prince, not a king. Who's the king? David. In other words, what you have here is an indication that somehow David is just kind of like, I'm good. You even saw it in the last chapter where he was trying to get out of executing the woman's judgment. Like he, he, The woman had to basically beg, remember in chapter 14, for him to actually execute judgment. He's like, oh, I'll just go home and maybe we'll deal with it later. That was his first response. David is passing up on the very thing that he's called to do. He's foregoing leadership of his family, leadership of his responsibility. Even friends, if you think back to the chapters just that we studied last week, with all that happened with Amnon his son raping his daughter, Amnon's half-sister Tamar, and Absalom and what he did to Amnon, one of the things that is so conspicuous is the absence of a father leading his family. David is angry in private but does nothing. He does nothing to actually lead his family and correct their sin. David, as a man, almost in his own life, in his own family, in his own leadership, he has gotten to a point where what I'm saying here, the effect of lingering guilt in David's life, one of them is passing over leadership, ministry, by withholding judgment. Basically, the category of the effect of this guilt is what I would describe as ministry to God. Ministry to God. One of the things that happens, friends, if you do not learn, if we do not learn to live in the grace of God, to actually forgive ourselves of what God has forgiven us, to believe his word over our failings, to keep 
our hearts and our hopes fixed upon him. What happens is if we do not do that, one of the things that can suffer is our very place of ministry that God has called us to. I bet that I could probably get some resonance with you if I ask, tell me a story in your life about a most shameful sin that you committed even after your salvation. And talk to me about how your ministry suffered because of that sin. Now, what I'm talking about here, of course, is not unrepentant sin. Of course, there's going to be suffering for unrepentant sin, and there should be. That's God's way of pursuing us in his discipline. He will pursue us and make us miserable until we get right with him again. But I'm talking about sin that you have repented of, that you have been forgiven. And yet, at times, is it not true in your own story that a lingering effect of guilt in your life is a loss of sense of calling and confidence in a place of ministry assignment that God has given to you. Maybe an abandonment of leadership, an abandonment of responsibility, a lack of willingness to step forward with courage to confront in the place where God has called you. Does that make sense? The question that I have before you is not just how has David changed, but notice how you have changed after shameful sin. How is it? Have there been places where your ministry has suffered? A second way that we can see an amazing effect of lingering guilt in David's life is in these passages in this way. Before David's shameful sin with, with Bathsheba and with Uriah, what we see is David is a man who seeks out God for help and who seeks out God for encouragement. For instance, if you look back at the story of how we've, where we've gone so far, think about back to 1 Samuel chapter 30. In verse 6, in one of the great places of David's trouble in his life, it says David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his own sons and daughters. But, here's what it said, at this time in his life, before these shameful sins, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, and his God. And it goes on in verse 7, and it says, And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David did what? He inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue after this man? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you'll surely overtake and surely rescue. In other words, what we have here is a man who in distress, he goes to God. He goes to God and he encourages himself in the Lord. He was reminding himself, God, 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 here's who you are. Here's who you are. Here's who you are. He's encouraging himself in the Lord. And he's also got, in the middle of a crazy conflict, again and again and again, we see David goes to God and he asks, God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? God, I need your help. God, I need your help. God, I need your help. And yet, after the shameful sins with Bathsheba and Uriah, here in these chapters, here's what we see, the after effect. Here's a man who's fleeing in fear and doing so without, at least what the Scripture says, without even seeking God. If you look at the text that we're studying today, 2 Samuel chapter 15, and look at verse 14, as soon as David hears that Absalom is coming against him, he's not going to encourage himself in the Lord. He's not going and saying, God, what shall I do? He is hitting out of town. Dude, arise. He didn't say dude, sorry. Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape from us from Absalom. In other words, he's going, oh, we're doomed. Oh, we're doomed. There's no way out. Instead of looking up, he's looking around. He's looking horizontally at circumstance. He's going, oh, this is horrible. we got to get out of here. Lest he overtake us quickly and he bring ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And this is, friends, even though back in chapter 12, Nathan had told David, you are not going to die. 
So somehow, David is believing his feelings over the word of God. David has gotten to a point where he is literally so down and discouraged with the Lord and with himself and with his circumstance that he has lost sight of God and all he's seeing is himself. He's lost sight of God's word and he's just feeling overwhelmed. And the after effects of lingering guilt is fleeing in fear without seeking God. I'll tell you the category that I want to name this. It's the category trust in God. One of the things that happens if we do not learn to live in God's grace, if we do not learn to forgive what God has forgiven, if we do not learn to keep our hearts and our hopes set upon Jesus, if we do not learn to believe his word over our feelings, one of the things that can suffer in our lives is our ability and willingness to put our reliance and trust in God. I bet if I asked you your story today and asked you about sins that you have committed, even as a believer, that God has forgiven, but you have struggled to forgive yourself, I bet one of the things that you would say has suffered in your life is your confidence in God, or even your willingness or ability to just run to him. <laughs> like a little child runs to their dad when they're afraid at night, like you just run to God, and you ask, Dad, what do I do? Dad, encourage me. Dad, help me. Obviously, something is broken in David, and he needs restoration. It's not just David, though. Notice how David has changed, yes, but also notice how you have changed after your shameful sin. What is your before and what is your after? This is the effects of lingering guilt in our lives. Another category that we see from these passages is as we look at these chapters before David's shameful sin, what we see is a man who longs for and enjoys like the presence of God like more than anything else. Here, David is like, one thing I have to sought after, Lord, one thing I have to go, I just want to be in your presence, God. I want to be in your courts. I want to sit where you are. Oh, God, there's no greater joy than just being with you. That's the David that we know. And yet, so for instance, I, I've, I'll give you an example of this earlier in the, in the book, Before the Shameful Sin, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12. Y'all remember the story when David brought the ark into Jerusalem? Y'all remember that? And we talked about how David went and he brought up the ark from God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David. woo It was a party. Where the ark is, I want to be there. I want to be near him. He made the ark the center of everything, the place of God's presence. That's it. It's that's, that's, that's like everything I want. And yet, after, in these chapters, look at what we see. We see a man who is separating himself. Separating himself from God's presence. If you look at chapter 15 and you look at verses 25 and 26, what you see is after the ark is there, they set down the ark of God. The two priests are going, it's good for us to get the ark near David at this moment. Like this is what he wants. This is everything. And yet the king says to Zach, carry the ark of God back to the city. If I find favor in God's eyes, he'll bring it back to me. Let him see both it and its dwelling place. And then he goes on and he says, but if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. In other words, there's a, who is this man? This is the guy who wanted everything to be near. God's presence was everything. And now, I don't know, I don't even, I don't even know if he wants me. If, if he wants me, he'll, he'll figure it out. But if not, I'll just stay here. Just content on the outskirts of the category I would name as intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. Friends, one of the lingering effects of guilt in our life is the loss of a sense of the enjoyment of God's presence. That unbridled joy. woo How great is it to be near God? And yet, if we struggle 
to live in God's grace, if we struggle to forgive ourselves of what God has forgiven, if we struggle to keep our hearts and our hopes fixed upon Jesus, if we struggle to believe his word over our feelings, one of the areas that will suffer is the area of our intimacy with God. We see the suffering in David's life, but friends, it's not just David's life. I bet if I asked you a story, you would say, I can see the effects of the suffering in my own life. Because it's not just how David has changed. How have you changed? Is there a before and an after in this area of intimacy with God? Is there lingering guilt in your life over sin that you have repented of and you have forsaken and God has forgiven and yet you have not learned to live in God's grace? Intimacy with God is something God desires and gifts to every one of us, not on the basis of what we have done, but the basis of what he has done for us. But friends, if we're not willing to receive and learn to live in what he has done for us, We will convince ourselves based on our circumstance or our feelings that somehow we are not worthy to enjoy an unbridled presence of our Savior. And that is not what God came to live, die, and rise again to accomplish for you. And yet that's where we find David. And how many of us, you don't have to raise your hand on the outside, but on the inside I would say, that's where I found myself. The last category And I do say last. Some of you are getting excited. But the last category that I want to point out to you today is the lingering effect of guilt on this way. Before, David was a man who defended the reputation of God's truth, and he defended God's name. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath, in verses 43 to 45, one of the things we learn, David says to Goliath, a big old tall guy. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, you have defied. And then he goes on and he says, this day I will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head so that people will know that there is a God in Israel. The battle is the Lord's, he goes on to say. This is the David we know. And yet, after his shameful sins with Bathsheba and Uriah, here comes another kind of woolly booger kind of guy. That's the Georgia phrase for you. With Shammai in chapter 16, coming out. Ha! I'm going to get you. You're a terrible guy. Doesn't it sound like Goliath's taunts? You're terrible. You're scum of the earth. You don't deserve to live. And yet, after David hears it, where's the guy who confronted David? In the name of the Lord, you are not to defy us. Our God is an awesome God. We are his people. This is not true. What God says is true. Where is that guy? Instead, in chapter 16, verses 9 and 10, what we see David saying, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he's cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall I say, what have, why have you done so? And verses 11 and 12, leave him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with the good for his cursing today. What is going on here, friends? It's a man who is dealing with lingering guilt, who has not learned to live in the grace of God. And the category that I would assign to this after effect is it's struggling with his identity. He is allowing the curses of Satan and Satan's messengers to be a louder voice in his ear than the truth of God. And he's just saying, if he's going to come at me, then let him come at me. This is maybe what I deserve. This, friends, has a lingering effect of David's guilt. And I wonder about you. Has there any one of you been challenged in your identity after sin? Challenged to believe who God says that you are versus how you feel that you are or what others say that you are or what sin says you are or what Satan says you are? I would imagine this is not just about David, but it's also about you. And I wonder about the before and after effects. Do you see this morning why I told you there's something lingering under this passage that has to be dealt with? Now I close by telling you this. I want to go back to the core truth. 
I said in the core truth at the beginning, something that David desperately needed and you and I desperately need, and it's this. We must learn to live in the freedom of God's forgiveness. Friends, one of the things that we have to learn is to be a gospel people. The gospel is not just for our salvation. It's not just for moments where we sin and we mess up and we run to God and say, I need your forgiveness. Yes, it is for those moments. But God, guys, the gospel is also for every moment of everyday life. We have to constantly be gospeling ourselves. We have to constantly be keeping our hearts and our hopes fixed upon the gospel of Jesus. The grace that he has freely given to us in Jesus Christ. Redeeming grace is the title of this series, and redeeming grace is the theme of this book, and redeeming grace has got to be the theme of our lives. Sure, we have sinned horrifically before God, but at the same time, we have been given extravagant love and grace. And we have to live in light of this gospel every single day. We have to learn to daily receive his grace by keeping our hearts and our hopes set upon Jesus. One of the things that I'm struck by in the passage is in chapter 15, verse 30, as David goes out with his head hung in his shame. He goes up the Mount of Olives weeping. And I believe it's in ways Reminder that David ultimately is not the real hero here because the reason he's there is, whew, it's tragic. But there's another who ends up going out of Jerusalem, outside of the city gates, and into the Mount of Olives weeping. And he's not going there because of anything he's done wrong. He's going there because of what we have done wrong, and his name was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Olives weeping over your sin and over mine so that we, in our sin, would have the opportunity, because of his sufferings for us, to be forgiven of all of our sin, cleansed of all of unrighteousness, and given the free grace of God. Jesus. Receiving his grace by keeping our hearts and our hopes set upon Jesus. Tim Keller says this, and I quote it almost every wedding that I ever officiate. If I ever officiate your wedding, here you go. You're going to get this line at some point. But the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. That's where David was, right? <laughs> sinful and flawed. I'm just so sinful and flawed. I'm so sinful and flawed. So sinful and flawed, but the gospel is not just that we are sinful and flawed. The gospel, yes, is that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe, but friends, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared to hope. Friends, we must preach the gospel to ourselves constantly. Yes, we are sinful. Yes, we are flawed. But yes, God loves us. And yes, God accepts us. Yes, he gives us grace. As we look at the cross, we see the horrors of our sin. But we also see the riches of his grace. And if you look at this chart, one of the things you have to see as you grow as a Christian, the cross has got to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in your heart and in your life. To learn to live in God's grace is to learn to live with a cross-centered view of everything. Because as you grow in the cross, you're growing in a growing awareness of how sinful and flawed you are. Oh, as you grow as a Christian, you're more sinful and flawed than you ever dared to believe. But as you also stare at the cross, you're also not looking just at the horrors of your sin, but you're also looking at the riches of God's grace. And as you're growing in the depth of awareness of your problems and issues and brokenness and failures and flaws, you at the same time as you look upon the cross of Jesus get to grow in the riches, the extravagance, the, the, the free gift, the covering, the acceptance, the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the fatherly affection of God. This is the gospel-centered life, and it's the life that God wants all of us to grow into. And friends, to grow in it, we've got to trust his word over our feelings. 
we have to trust and proclaim the gospel. We have to know his word. In moments where we're overcome by looking at our circumstance and going, oh gosh, this is just all because of me, or oh no, God will never love me, or oh no, I remember what happened, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of just feeling everything based on our own thoughts, our own hearts, or our own circumstance, we have to submit ourselves to the truth of God's word. Psalm 103, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward those who fear him. Who's memorized this and quotes it in times of despair, discouragement, lingering guilt? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from us. David, where are you? Why aren't you remembering? And friends, where are you? And why aren't you remembering? Isaiah 43, 25, I am he who blots out transgressions for my own sake, I do not remember sins. Romans 8, 1 and 2. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 2 Corinthians 5. From now on, we regard no one, not even ourselves, according to the flesh. For though we were once regarded Christ. According to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 